All right. All right. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Fanny Habashank. I'm class of 84, parent of 2015 and 19. And my title at the college is Alumni Engagement Director. Um, thank you again for joining us tonight for what we believe to be a record-breaking virtual alumni event for Washington College. I'm proud to introduce Dr. Richard Gillen, the reason we all want to be here tonight. Thank you so much for doing this, Rich. Well, I'm, 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 I'm very grateful for the opportunity, and I, I mean that. Uh, well, it's a thrill for us, and I, even though I know you really don't need an introduction, I've got a little one here, but if you're online this evening, you probably already know and love Rich, but uh, he began here at Washington College in 1973 and retired just recently in the fall of 2019. Dr. Gillen was the Ernest A. Howard Professor of English Literature. He acted as chair of the Humanities Department as well as the English Department for a number of years. Many of you online tonight may have had the pleasure of taking part in the Kiplin Hall program, which Rich and his wife Barbara started and led for many years. Upon retiring, Rich was awarded the title of Professor Emeritus Status by the Board of Visitors and Governors. So as John said during the presentation, please keep your computer muted, but feel free to use the chat box for your questions. And now it's my pleasure to turn this call over to Rich Gillen. Well, thank you. Um, my, my plan tonight is to um, deal with uh, at least two poems, one from William Wordsworth and one from John Keats. Um, I have four poems, but my daughters who are, who are veterans of Zoom uh, have told me that the best thing to do, brevity is really more important than uh, length. Uh, and so and with that regard, I, I um, will, will try to keep it uh, under uh, well, about, about 40 minutes or so and leave time later for questions and I'd be glad to answer them. And, and the issue is uh, why Wordsworth, why Keats. Well, they're, they're favorites for one thing, um, but I think that I, I have found, uh, especially over the past few months, that I drift back into poetry uh, a lot. Um, and some of the poets, uh, particularly Wordsworth and Keats, seem to speak uh, to the moment in many ways. I think COVID has made us all um, much more aware of ourselves. We've had to do a lot of uh, you know, kind of solitary thinking and uh, perhaps uh, thinking that's tinged with fear. Uh, and, and the question becomes, what, what is there that is substantial? What, will, what can carry on and what, what can work for the future? And what can we hold on to um, as we move into the future? And so um, the first poem I want to look at is called Expostulation and Reply. And it's a poem that uh, Wordsworth, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, in which Wordsworth recounts uh, an incident uh, where he is um, in school and his teacher uh, confronts him with a question and uh, he responds. Uh, it's a very simply organized poem, uh, but it contains within it a number of, a number of elements that have to do with creativity and the notion of creative writing. And I'll get to that in a minute, but let me just go through the poem uh, once and then we can take it apart. Why, William, on that old gray stone, thus for the length of half a day, why, William, sit you thus alone and dream your time away? Where are your books that light bequeathed to beings else forlorn and blind? Up, up, and drink the spirit breathed from dead men to their kind. You look round on your mother earth as if she for no purpose bore you, as if you were her firstborn birth and none had lived before you. One morning thus by Estwaith Lake, when life was sweet, I knew not why, to me my good friend Matthew spake, and thus I make reply. The eye it cannot choose but see, we cannot bid the ear be still, our bodies feel where'er they be, against or with our will. Nor less I deem that there are powers which of themselves our minds impress, that we can feed this mind of ours in a wise passiveness. Think you mid all this mighty sum of things forever speaking, that nothing of itself will come, but we must still be seeking? Then ask not wherefore, here alone, Conversing as I may, I sit upon this old gray stone 
and dream my time away. Well, it, it's pretty obvious, uh, even from a uh, surface reading, that um, the teacher is kind of, he's pretty upset, annoyed, actually, that uh, Wordsworth seems to be wasting his time. And I, I think that all of us have had moments, perhaps, perhaps a lot, when we were uh, in as students, working as students, that uh, we should be doing something, something functional, something worthwhile. Um, and the Matthew, the uh, older person here, uh, chides him and says, you should be reading. And he cites books. Where are your books? Um, and there's a kind of irony built in to the very way that he's expressing this, that light bequeathed from to beings else forlorn and blind. Well, there's a kind of irony there, subtle. Uh, you read too many books and uh, you do go sort of blind. Your eyes get tired, they get worn out. I'm, I'm wearing glasses, having read many, many papers. Um, up, up and drink the spirit, breathe from dead men to their kind. The irony there is that um, dead men don't breathe. Uh, but what he's alluding to, of course, is the way that in books, um, there is the accrued wisdom of a particular culture or a particular individual. Um, and he continues his chiding. Um, you, look, you look at your mother earth as if she for no purpose bore you, as if you were the firstborn birth and none had lived before you. How many times in your life have you heard people chide you uh, for wasting time and, and not, uh, not uh, doing what you ought to be doing. So, I mean, in, in a sense, uh, William is, I think, more or less uh, em emblematic of uh, an authority who's chiding uh, Wordsworth to uh, kind of get with it uh, and get his act together. Uh, again, I think that's pretty, pretty close. Um, he says, one morning by Estwaite Lake, when life was sweet, uh, that whole idea of life being sweet. It, he's talking about uh, uh, a place in the lakes. Uh, Estwaith Lake is not very far from uh, where Wordsworth um, uh, went to school. In fact, it's very near where Beatrix Potter lived as well. Um, he went to school in Haw uh, yeah, Hawks Hawksmoor. And uh, so the, the uh, point he's making here is that there is at this time of life so something that is delightful and uncomplicated. Um, and then he said, then he comes back with, I think, the really core of the poem, the eye it cannot choose but see. Uh, we're always taking in information. We're continually absorbing things that we see that we might or might not register that many of them uh, kind of come to us and make their impression almost subconsciously. And um, unless we close our eyes uh, consciously, uh, we're always getting that kind of sensual input. Uh, we can't, we cannot bid the ear be still. Same thing with the ear. We're always hearing, we're listening. Um, our bodies feel where'er they be, against or with our will. Uh, we are, our um, perception of what's going on around us to a certain degree is directed by our will that we are you know, consciously listening for certain things. But there's an awful lot that also goes on that we're not really consciously listening to or seeing, but it's there and we're taking it in, we're absorbing that. In other words, the senses are always active, they're always alive and they're accepting things around us. Um, if we, uh, John, that just flipped, you got the ode to melancholy out. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, we are like a sponge. We're always taking in information. And he continues with that and says, no less I deem that there are powers which of themselves our minds impress, that we can feed this mind of ours in a wise passiveness. This idea of wisdom and passivity, uh, the idea of being wise from being, again, to use the analogy, like a sponge absorbing what's around us. Uh, the point he's making here is that there's a certain kind of wisdom that comes from that. And, and this is directly linked to something that he talks about in other poems like Tintern Abbey and in the Prelude, uh, where creativity comes from the ability to 
um, kind of block our, uh, the way that we uh, consciously look in the world, the way in which we search with our senses and let the, let the world impress itself upon us by being passive uh, we, and being conscious of that passivity, uh, we begin the first step of creativity. Uh, in the larger context of Wordsworth's concept of the imagination, what this means is that uh, by, be, by absorbing what's around us, uh, we can feel deeply. Uh, and in a sense, it's that feeling that we have uh, that allows the imagination to come into play as the feeling stimulates our perception of it. Um, to put it into a kind of diagrammatic way, it begins with feeling, uh, feeling something whatever that stimulus is, whatever that sensation is, dwelling upon it. And at a certain point, after dwelling upon it, it becomes the thing itself, the actual stimulus sort of dissipates. And we, as he says in, the, uh, in Tintern Abbey, we see into the life of things. Um, we have a kind of transformative moment in which the imagination opens and operates and allows us to perceive um, eternity to perceive something that is insubstantial, spiritual, uh, and yet at the same time um, relevant. Uh, and then he says, just as in a conclusion here, think you amid all this mighty sum of things forever speaking that nothing of itself will come, but we must still be seeking. Um, the idea, now he's talking here in a somewhat oblique way about rationality. Now keep in mind, this is the uh, late 18th century. And so reason, of course, is the uh, uh, hallmark of the age. Uh, and what he's objecting to is the way in which we think that we're rational, and we think that we act rational, but in fact, we really act out of impulse <clears throat> a good deal of time. And that the imagination can be stifled by too much reason, too much rationality. Um, and he concludes about, then, then ask not wherefore here alone conversing as I may, I sit upon this old gray stone and dream my time away. That idea of dreaming and the notion of getting lost to our own thoughts seems to me to be um, a very substantial thing. Um, I, I, again, I'm, I'm guessing at this, but I suspect we've all had a lot of time over the past several months to sort of dwell upon our thoughts, our innermost thoughts. And in that, in that process, uh, we get into a kind, of, a kind of dreamscape. And by that, I mean something, it's almost like what the um, Australian Aborigines talk about when they talk about dreamland, um, this uh, sense that uh, there is something in the spiritual world that we come to by allowing ourselves to be taken by our feelings and then dwelling upon those feelings that uh, open up those perceptions of uh, eternity. Um, I'm just checking about time. Uh, let, me, let me continue, uh, let me move over. First of all, do you have, are there, are there any questions right now that have come up, anything I can talk about? We don't have any questions yet. Okay. Uh, several people saying hello and calling out to their Kipling Hall trips. Um, perhaps we can. Perhaps no, question. we can. no questions as such. Okay. okay. Um, let me move over to Keats, and if I have time, we'll come back to Wordsworth, if that's okay. Um, the Ode on Melancholy. Um, this is one of Keats' um, odes that he wrote in 1819. Keats, it, it, to me, he's fascinating in a host of ways, and he has the ability to do something which I deeply envy. Um, he could read what he had written, and he could see where the flaws were. And, and during the year, 18, the year 1818 to uh, midway through 1819, we can see how Keats goes from being a good student writer, a good student uh, poet, to becoming a major poet. Uh, and in this, uh, we, we see um, the kind of beauty that I think most people associate with Keats and also 
um, the way in which his intellect uh, comes to grip with something that we've all experienced. Um, so let me start off with this. No, no, go not to Lethe, nor twist wolf's bane, tight rooted for its poisonous wine, nor suffer thy pale forehead to be kissed by nightshade, ruby grape or proserpine. Make not your rosary of yewberries, nor let the beetle, nor the death moth be your mournful psyche, nor the downy owl a partner in your sorrow's mysteries. For shade to shade will come too drowsily and down, drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. I think it's probably true, I think for, for me certainly, and I think for perhaps most people, that um, if you had a choice between pleasure and pain, uh, between feeling good about something and feeling sad, most of us would prefer the positive side, the pleasurable side, if I can use that uh, analogy. Um, and that when we start to have pain, when we start to feel uncomfortable, I think in our society, we tend to pop a pill or something like that to get rid of that feeling, uh, to dissipate whatever it is that's sort of intruding itself on our, our uh, sense of being. And what Keats is advocating here is something com completely around the corner. And what he's saying is, uh, no, no, go not to Lethe. Um, when you're feeling melancholic, don't try to forget it. Uh, don't try to smother it. As he says here, uh, neither twist wolf's bane tight rooted for its poisonous wine. Um, don't, uh, don't be led to killing yourself. Don't be led to killing um, the feeling more specifically. And he uses a number of images here that deal with um, either narcotics or with uh, death. Uh, I'm sorry, nightshade, ruby grape of proserpine, make not your rosary of yewberries. Um, nor let the beetle or the death moth be your down, mournful psyche, nor the downy owl a partner in your sorrow's mysteries. Um, do not shy away from feeling the fullness of melancholy. Um, because, as he says, if we don't, shade to shade will come too drowsily and drown the wakeful anguish of the soul. The particular nuances of discomfort, the particular nuances of melancholy, or the blues, to use another analogy, um, there are particularities about that. Now, if you kind of think about it, we can probably um, more easily think about gradations of joy or pleasure. Uh, and more or less isolate them and, and see them as being something bountiful and good. And what he's suggesting is that when we feel melancholy, our tendency is to kind of package it up and more or less dispose of it to try to get rid of it. Um, that's what he, when he says here, shade to shade will come too drowsily. No, feel each particular of the melancholy uh, sensation or the feeling. Uh, and then he continues on. But when the melancholy fit shall fall sudden from heaven like a weeping cloud that fosters the droop-headed flowers all and hides the green hill in an April shroud, then glut thy sorrow on a morning rose or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave or on the wealth of globed peonies. Or if thy mistress some rich anger shows, imprison her soft hand and let her rave and feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. Okay, we can, um, if you think about it, how many, how many different moods have you experienced today? Um, I bet if you went back and really tried to count them, there's probably a, a myriad of uh, different, different moods that you've gone through. And uh, even if, let's say this morning uh, in Chestertown, it was very, very warm and, sultry and beautiful in its own unique sort of late August way. Um, and it, you'd have to be a plank not to feel something uh, positive. And yet, uh, isn't it true that when we feel something very intensely, something pleasurable, melancholy can just well up and all of a sudden what seemed to be um, a pleasure gets overlaid with other thoughts. Uh, to use my analogy, uh, the sensation might be initially something very positive, but then you start thinking, um, oh my God, what's going on with COVID today or something like that? And immediately uh, that positive feeling is overwhelmed. So to go back to his lines here, this happens quickly. Melancholy just wells up and takes us over. 
um, and uh, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, even the allusion he makes here to April, how those this kind of beautiful April morning that we might imagine uh, gets taken over, especially in England, uh, by rain uh, and indeed the shroud that goes with it, the mist and so forth, uh, so that brightness gets overlaid with darkness, uh, bright feelings get overlaid with melancholy. And then he, he advises glut, it's an interesting word, glut thy sorrow on a morning rose. It's almost as if he's suggesting eating it and, and kind of uh, feeling the fullness of a morning rose. I think, at least in a lot of literature, particularly a lot of Renaissance literature, uh, roses are always associated with something beautiful and something desirable, uh, something positive. Um, and what he, I think, is using here is that image of a morning rose. Uh, think of a rose perhaps with you know, dew drops on it. Um, and when you're feeling melancholy, what you might have associated with something positive and beautiful, take that in when you're in that melancholy mood. In other words, bring together uh, past associations that are positive with what you're feeling now uh, that in the state of melancholy so that the rose is no longer simple, it's no longer the innocent rose, it takes on a complexity that when you experience a rose again, uh, it will have a dual association, both with the positiveness, shall we say, with past associations of all its beauty, and perhaps the uh, sadness and sorrow that comes from feeling it in the melancholy fit. Or on the rainbow of the salt sand wave, or on the wealth of globed peonies, um, Think of peonies, usually they seem to come into bloom in May, um, and they, they just seem to be rich in terms of this almost like a continual promise as they, as they reach their maturity. Uh, these, um, the, the very sound of the words themselves more or less enacts what it almost feels like in, in your mouth, the wealth of globed peonies, something luscious. Or if thy mistress some rich anger shows, imprison her soft hand and let her rave and feed deep, deep upon her peerless eyes. I think in this element of the poem, he's talking about the way, the way that um, a relationship really matures after you've had disagreements, after you've had, let's say, very sharp disagreements, and get around them. You find a way to get through um, that a real relationship, a loving relationship indeed, um, surpasses the simplicity of something that is pleasurable simply uh, on a, a very um, innocent way. Um, when he says here, when your mistress, your girlfriend is really angry, feed deep upon her eyes, uh, feed deep upon her in that context, um, bringing together uh, presumably the, the delight in having a relationship with the ability to have discord and to be able to get through it um, shows uh, a, a different kind of beauty is a, um, no longer is the simple, should we say, uh, loving relationship that it is now something more, um, has greater depth, has more maturity. And then she, meaning melancholy, she dwells with beauty, beauty that must die. Uh, this is, again, one of those phrases, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, that seem quintessentially Keatsian. Um, the beauty becomes more intense because we know it can't last. Uh, that beauty is something that is evanescent uh, and we can't hold on to it. Um, it's the, one of the things that Keats develops in his other poetry about the way in which um, we can't sustain anything for very long and it becomes endemic that we accept the world as it is, that the idea of escaping the world and going somewhere else, think of Shelley perhaps in that context, uh, that's not adequate. Uh, in order to live in this world, we need to be able to accept the brevity of something like beauty and all that goes with it as he says in the next line, 
and joy whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu. The moment that we are aware that we're feeling joy is the very moment that joy is mitigated, that the rational realization that, oh, this feels really good, as soon as we realize that, um, the intensity has already started to diminish. It doesn't go all the way at once, but it's already disappearing. In other words, there is, uh, in, let's say, experiencing beauty, there is the intensity of the moment itself, but then as we think about it, as soon as we become conscious of beauty, it's dissipating, it's going away. Uh, and this is what he's suggesting about melancholy, he's leading up to this, I should say, the idea that melancholy is something that we may find disagreeable, but by accepting it, we also come to realize that it can't last like everything else. It must uh, eventually um, dissipate. So then he says further, um, an aching pleasure nigh, whoops, let me turning to poison while the bee mouth sips. Again, this, I, he's going back to what he was saying about beauty with a, better, a greater intensity, that uh, pleasure is real, certainly. But again, thought, as we think about it, it dissipates it. I, in the very temple of delight, veiled melancholy has a sovereign shrine, though seen of none save him whose strenuous tongue can burst joy's grape against his palate fine. His soul shall taste the sadness of her might and be among her cloudy trophies hung. Um, the image is, is a little bit comical here, I think. Maybe it's just me. But uh, if you really like grapes, and uh, that's the image he's developing, uh, and you put it into your mouth with the idea that you can't wait to feel the pleasure of tasting the grape, um, you can hold it in your mouth for a long period of time, but if you're actually going to taste it, you have to take the courage to let it explode on your tongue. Uh, and the image in that he's trying to pull together the statements he's made about beauty and pleasure, that the um, anticipation of joy uh, brings with it some doubts because we want to hold it for as long as we can. Uh, at the same time, we know that if we're actually to experience life, if we're experiencing beauty, we must take that courage and burst joy's grape. Um, and the question might be, okay, why these poems and why, when I said uh, as a title for this uh, talk tonight, uh, how does this fit in with COVID? And what I, I firmly believe um, is that we, we live at a time in which so many things are difficult. It's like I, I was talking with um, uh, Frank the other day uh, about how no matter how much we try to relax, there's always in the background that sense that, okay, there's, you know, is today the day I'm going to get sick or some, or some friend of mine or something like that? Uh, and it's always kind of there. Uh, and with, that, uh, with that, that kind of thought or that sense of a kind of backdrop of noise, uh, uncomfortable noise, comes with it the idea that w this is our life and we need to be able to accept it um, and in the process find, find ways of finding something of substance. For Keats, it's the realization of life's brevity and the way that these moments of great joy are intensities, and these intensities shape our life, um, uh, life for the future, uh, and they're meaningful. For Wordsworth, it's that idea of being of passivity and developing the uh, developing the ability to accept um, things as they are and find in them, as we deal with them, something that uh, gives us more than just hope. To go back to Wordsworth for a minute, for Wordsworth it's the idea that um, joy and the way in which we come to understand joy um, and the way in which we intensely dwell on specific feelings that open up our own consciousness, we are able to meet, if you will, with the eternal that we come to, come to experience something that is um, deeply spiritual and 
ultimately connected with meaning in the world. Um, it's, I think, in, in both these poems, I think it's the emphasis on various kinds of hope that are important. And when I say hope, I don't mean hope for something tangible, like hope uh, you get a new car or something like that. Uh, but it's living in hope, living in the context of what hope represents. That is to say, a, a kind of belief that there is value in life, that there's meaning in life, and that that meaning and the uh, continual perception of the way in which we come to that meaning um, gives us uh, solace and, and gives us at least um, a kind of impetus uh, to, to live on. Um, I've got more poems, but I... We've got a few questions, Dr. Gill, if you don't mind. Okay, so let's go with that, and then if we have time, we can continue or not, either so, way. Um, I'll read the first one. The, the illustrious Megan Curran asks... Um, I, I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Um, Megan was asking, as you were finishing up with the Woodsworth poem, you made a reference to the Aboriginal idea of dreamland. Yeah. And do you know if Woodsworth was aware of, of that, or is that a connection you're making? Uh, it's it's me. Um, I, he, he, Wordsworth could have, but I would. I don't. I'm not aware of any um, uh, any record of his having engaged with uh, uh, Dreamland. But I was thinking specifically of you know Captain Cook was a great hero in England, and he was uh, making his uh, worldwide tour um, of well his journey around the world, the first journey in the 1770s. So it's it's possible that he may have gotten something from, from Cook's journals. Um, next question, Heather and James, you're on alert. I'm going to try to unmute you. Um, they were having trouble typing with, with their phone. Okay. Am I unmuted now, John? I hear you, Heather. Awesome. Um, so I had a question about um, kind of Wordsworth in comparison to Coleridge, since I'm more familiar with uh, Coleridge's uh, theories on the mind. Yeah. So how, when you were talking about creativity and rationality and reasoning, um, how does Wordsworth's idea um, of what creativity and reasoning um, how, what is it like kind of in comparison? I mean, did he have a scientific framework that he was really using in kind of the way that Coleridge was, or um, was he less influenced by specific theories? Uh, not, not, a, not certainly not a scientific one, although he was, he was very much uh, well-educated in science for his time. Um, and the relationship between Coleridge and Wordsworth on that particular issue um, it's, it's, there's a real blending. I mean, uh, many people have said that uh, it was Coleridge who made Wordsworth into the poet he was because he supplied Wordsworth with the philosophical underpinnings. Um, but I would say that uh, in, in both cases, well, let me just kind of sort that out. For Wordsworth, the, it begins with um, impressions, deep impressions taken from the natural world. And to get those impressions, we have to kind of clear our minds and we got to clear, if you will, um, the ability to be able to accept those impressions as purely as possible without inter intervening. And once, once that happens, the next step is then dwelling upon the impression and to the point at which the original impression kind of uh, gives away, it gives off, it goes away. Uh, the actual stimulus, and what we're left with is kind of what's what's behind the kind of spiritual residue. Uh, that for that at that point, the imagination gets stimulated and acts as a, an interlocutor between the eternal and the individual. For um, Coleridge, uh, the imagination—it's uh, probably in many ways. I think it's. Um, in Kubla Khan especially, uh, he's uh, talking about that. And he illustrates in that poem how the landscape that he describes um, is emblematic of the mind and how the, um, the river 
that he describes. The Alf, the sacred river, goes down into the very uh, core of the earth. Uh, and at a certain point, it is shot up. And there is a conjunction between the core of the earth that opens up and we see these icy caves and up on top we have the sunny pleasure dome. Um, the opposites come together um, and uh, so what we have is, is again very very close to Wordsworth and I, um, the nuances are there. Pardon me. Um, let me use another example for Wordsworth and go back to Coleridge. In the prelude in book six, he talks about his trip, his hiking trip uh, in the Vale of Chamonix. And in the Vale of Chamonix, he's anticipated, he and his friend Bob Jones, they anticipate uh, having this moment where they're going to go across the uh, Simplon Pass and have this vision of God. Uh, and they, they have this in their mind. They have hiked all the way from Cambridge across Europe and, and into the Vale of Chamonix. Um, it turns out that um, they realized that they had already been at the top of the pass and they're actually going downhill uh, and they're just devastated at the time. Ten years later, Wordsworth, in writing the prelude, talks about that particular incident and he reimagines, refeels the devastation that he felt at the time that uh, things, did, you know, things didn't work out with this vision of God. And he remembers specific elements of the natural scene. He talks about winds, fording winds. Um, he talks about um, the uh, streams um, continuing on. Uh, and he talks about the way in which the landscape, the forest, I should say, uh, is endless. And what he comes to perceive from that is the continuity he finds in nature. Now, uh, again, when he talks about the forest, uh, it's, not the, it's not the same forest uh, that if we went to see it today, it's still there, but it's not the exact same forest. It's a process. He, he, in other words, he sees in the natural world the process of things becoming, uh, things coming into existence and things being, if you will. Um, and it's that awareness of process that goes back to the way in which passivity moves toward this enlightenment and how the how process uh, is ongoing. Uh, that that uh, there if, again, if we went to the Vale of Chamonix, we would probably see the winds thwarting winds and the, the forest uh, never decaying, um, hang, uh, being in a sense in that process of the natural world. Now he gets this from Coleridge. This next step, Coleridge, um, in discussing things with him makes the analogy to the Holy Trinity, uh, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And uh, what Coleridge gives Wordsworth um, is the idea that uh, in the very beginning, uh, God existed. And at a certain point, God then becomes conscious of himself. Uh, and that's manifested in the, in the form of Jesus, that God exists, Jesus coming into being is God's ability to perceive himself, and that happens through the agency of the Holy Spirit. So what we have, in other words, is the ongoing process um, of perception, or more specifically, self-perception, coming to understand oneself in, by contemplating uh, the self um, individually this becomes the, the elemental process. Am I, am I making sense? No? Okay. I, I, muted, I muted the phone again. Let me see if I can unmute them. Okay. Yes, I'm, yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, so when you were talking about transitions, I want to bring up Heather Culp's uh, question. Can you talk about talk more about how these works spoke to you in a different way given our current environment uh, than you thought about them or when you taught them yes um yeah it's very personal but um it's kind of like twin blows um losing barbara was uh, is devastating um covid coming on just added to the general disorientation. 
And what I found myself doing is um, looking at, I mean, very, very unorganized, in an organ unorganized way, looking at uh, poems, uh, poems that, um, in fact, they, they spoke to me, uh, um, uh, poems that I have taught for many years, poems that I talked about in the fall, and, and coming to them again, at first it was, um, I felt very awkward and uh, at the same time kind of reassured. It's like, okay, so what I've been talking about for 46 years um, wasn't just a lot of hot air, uh, not that I ever intended it to be, uh, but that it really had substance and it spoke uh, at a time uh, when things were going wayward. Um, I think that, uh, well, as I mentioned before, I was living in Baltimore and uh, as opposed to Quaker Neck, which is, you know, pretty quiet, uh, in the evenings, um, we, were going, we were going to bed very early, it was cold, um, but I would hear the sirens from ambulances going to uh, uh, GBMC or to St. Uh, Saint, uh, Joseph's Hospital, uh, which are both within about a mile of where we're living, and just the awareness that, okay, I'm alive right now and I'm well, and there are people out there, and they're, they're dying or they're very sick. And, and their lives are being disrupted. Um, how, do, how do we come to grips? Uh, how can I come to grips with that? And what I found in, in going back to the poets, um, a, a number of, not just the Romantic poets, but even the Victorian poets and even some 18th century poets, um, some of them with a kind of, uh, a kind of sardan sardonic dimension to it. Those of you who are familiar with Alexander Pope and the Dunciad, in which he illustrates how his society uh, was being um, run by dunces. Uh, and at the very end of that, he talks about how darkness covers all. Um, and there was a kind of perverse, uh, okay, uh, so we've all been here before. Things are, are seeming scattered and uh, rather hopeless at various times. Uh, but the, the, the note that struck me the best was uh, this idea that uh, hope, in fact, I wrote something, it was originally for my children, and I, I shared it with a number of other people as well, uh, talking about how uh, both Barbara and I lived in hope. Um, we had hopes for the future, we had hopes all through our relationship, going back to when we were teenagers, um, and we, we got along really well, and I'm not trying to put a happy face on it, it's true. Um, and how in the worst of times when we were both sick, and Barbara much more sick than I, um, that in the mix, midst of all that, there was always this belief that, okay, um, she's really strong, she's going to beat cancer, uh, and it's, it's going to be okay. Um, and then it wasn't, uh, she died. So what, what do we make of hope? Uh, do, we just, do, do I just sort of trash it and you know, move on? Uh, and no, uh, because it wasn't about, it wasn't about a thing. Um, it was about a way of life, a way of thinking that, that hope uh, was a binding force. And the living in that hope uh, was something that carried over. And I kept finding, finding elements of that in the poetry, like the poems we looked at tonight. And I still find, uh, I, I find more and more strength in that. Um, and to, well, to, to put this in another context, um, uh, I think I'm fortunate not to have had to deal with uh, what's going on these days. I mean, tonight is fine. Uh, uh, and, and I really, I mean, I'm enjoying this a great deal, uh, but, what's facing the faculty uh, right now is pretty much overwhelming. And uh, uh, so I, I, you know, I have, a <clears throat> I guess, a kind of mixed way of looking at how would I deal with classes now? Uh, it's, it feels very different tonight. Now, I know you're all there, but in class, there's a kind of uh, physicality that uh, I always found to be very useful to looking at people's expressions and listening to what people would say uh, in the moment, um, that, that made things move differently. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rattling on here and I don't mean to do that. 
think you're doing fine. Um, but if you don't mind, we, I think we have time. We can do one more question. Um, and I'm sorry, the chat box is filled up. That I have lost the thread. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Olivia Sirio had asked, um, do you think that these poems capitalize on the concept of the sublime as it pertains to emotional experiences as opposed to more tangible? Yes. Y yes, absolutely. Um, and I think it's uh, one of the links between Wordsworth and Coleridge. Um, Coleridge and, I'm sorry, Coleridge, uh, Keats. Um, Keats and Wordsworth met. Keats was much younger. Um, and uh, Keats was uh, being introduced to the literary world in London. And uh, he was at a party that was given by Hayden, and it was called the Immortal Dinner, and it had all the sort of um, great names of the period, both uh, writers as well as painters. And uh, Wordsworth was there, and Wordsworth was, um, you know, very much full of himself, I think, at least as I read, uh, have read the story about the, about the uh, meeting. And, and Keats, you know, feeling really like the odd guy out because he was. I mean, they made it very clear that he wasn't a university graduate, um, that he was a, uh, uh, an ordinary guy um, for the most part. Anyway, Keats records that uh, how um, he, he really respected Wordsworth, and at one point um, later, uh, in fact, in his life, he would actually go to the Lake District and um, literally knock at, key at, at uh, Wordsworth's door, and Wordsworth wasn't there, but it was, it was on that trip that uh, Keats uh, got sick. And anyway, I don't, I don't want to go through the whole biography, but um, uh, my point is that uh, Keats was singularly unimpressed by the literary uh, luminaries at the time. Uh, Wordsworth, we know, uh, was uh, not condescending entirely, but he was, you know, sort of um, kind of giving a number of black, uh, backhanded compliments to Keats uh, and kind of hoping that he would be, uh, you know, he would grow more, which of course did happen. Um, and I just lost, I lost, I've lost the thread. What was I answering? <laughs> you were talking about the sublime. The sublime, uh, yeah. Um, we have to be aware, of course, that, uh, well, the best example of the sublime in Wordsworth is the prelude, uh, where he, he talks about uh, being shaped by beauty and fear. And those of you who were on the Kipling trips probably recall many instances where there was a lot to be <laughs> afraid of uh, in terms of falling off mountains and things like that. Um, and he means that, uh, that uh, one of the things he uses as an example is when he was a child, he went out stealing bird's eggs. Uh, and to do that, he had to hang on to uh, grasses and uh, small outcroppings of rock on these sheer cliffs just to steal the bird's egg. Uh, and he, later on in the prelude, he talks about the feeling that's unique between the, the excitement, the rush of being in a situation that's really dangerous uh, and the kind of joy that comes from that rush. And yet at the same time, it's predicated upon danger. I think with Keats, the sublime comes in his language and the way that uh, he uh, believes in the, the power, the transformative power of beauty. Um, if you remember in uh, the um, Eve of St. Agnes, uh, we have uh, a story. It's a kind of loosely based on uh, Romeo and Juliet, but in the in the storyline, we see that uh, Porphyro, young guy, uh, is uh, on. He goes to visit uh, uh, Madeline, uh, probably with the with the expectation of uh, uh, fulfilling his own sensual desire for her, um, and in the process, uh, he comes in, into a moment where her beauty is so intensely realized uh, that he cannot uh, do, he's not motivated by sex. Uh, he becomes motivated by something much more profound um, and in the end uh, learns to genuinely love her and the lovers go off. Oh, well, if you've not read it, I won't ruin the poem. But um, the, the point is that uh, the sublime takes place because of the power of beauty and, and there's a transformative dimension to it. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, Rich, this has been a wonderful night. I'm going to share with you when we're done all of the comments of love and appreciation that people are leaving here in the chat um, for you uh, because you deserve a chance to read them all. I want to take a minute and thank everybody who made time to be on this call to be here tonight on behalf of the alumni office. We knew we were struggling to figure out how we were going to have some alumni events this year with everything going on. Um, you may know we've got other classes scheduled ranging from book discussions to other lectures. Um, so I encourage you to visit the website and check that out. Um, thank you, everybody. John, before we sign off, can I just um, tell you one bit of uh, good news? Um, uh, about five years ago, I had <laughs> Barbara was on my back to take a sabbatical. I had one sabbatical up to that point in 40 years or something like that. And so she needed a sabbatical. And I said, well, I need to do something. And she said, well, write a book. Um, and so I, I got the sabbatical and I did write um, the manuscript to a book. It was pretty long, about 300 and some odd pages. Um, and uh, when we both got sick, uh, I just, I, I just walked away from it. I, I had no no desire to engage with it again. Uh, and then I got really uh, lazy um, uh, and didn't do anything. And uh, this spring, uh, my daughters, uh, Courtney and Erin, were on me. Erin, especially, whenever I came up here to visit, hello, Erin, I know you're out there, uh, she would say, uh, you need to get, get back to the book. So eventually I did. Um, and uh, in June, um, the publisher uh, expressed interest, and uh, to make a long story short, um, they had uh, the book had the manuscript had to be read by uh, two uh, readers, two critics, uh, and that was done in June and July. And uh, just a week or so ago, uh, I got back the information that they received very high praise, and they're going to publish the book. Um, uh, right now, we're in the final stages of picking out uh, the cover art and things like that. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy about it. The book deals with uh, the Kiplin Hall program. Uh, and the point of the book, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's not really a simple one to kind of put into one category. It's not, it's a kind of memoir in part, uh, but it's really, um, a kind of defense of liberal arts education and why liberal arts education ultimately is very much needed right now and how I my years of uh, work here at Washington College particularly uh, I've come to see how valuable it is for the students that I've come to know uh, and so that's that's like at some point coming out I don't know when but it's at least it's on its way uh, Everybody with your camera on, give a nod if you would come to a book discussion. <laughs> there we go. Well, let me just, uh, just one last thing and I will stop. Uh, I am telling the absolute truth here uh, that I am absolutely grateful uh, for having this opportunity. I thank uh, Fanny and John, uh, as well as Emily, Kate, and uh, Susie uh, Chase for dreaming this up and uh, having it happen. And I, I truly look forward to the time when I'll be able to see you in person uh, again. Um, I, I have been asked to do another class in the spring. And uh, so I'll get, I'll get busy trying to organize that and see if I can get something that'll be interesting, I hope. But anyway, thank you. And, and thank you. One, one last thing. Sorry, one last thing, one last thing. I, I want to thank uh, uh, the alumni. Um, things happened again in the fall that were um, pretty upsetting. And um, it was when Barbara was in the hospice uh, in Towson uh, that a number of former students showed up. And uh, I can't tell you how deeply moving that was and how significant it was for Barbara. Um, to have those visits. Uh, and it's all due to the fundamental tie that I think we've, we all share as having been part of the Washington College community. And, and I um, look forward to fostering that and 
to sharing in it in the future. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Dr. Gillen. Thank you, 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 Dr. Gillen. Thank you so much, Dr. Gillen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gillen. Thank you, Rich. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Gillen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is like this is like a a quick life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gillen. You all look all look good. Thank you so much. How do you? You look good. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Gillen. Be this well. is amazing. Yes, this one is always, sir. Gallery view. Yeah, you want to Thank best you so much. Of, best night of COVID so far. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Indeed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Gillen. So